Since I first mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, a lot of people have asked me about neuromorphic chips, what they are, and why they are so important to the future of neural networks, artificial intelligence, and quite likely to Tesla itself and full self-driving. Let's take a look. For those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So before I continue, I wanna say I've got a couple of new t-shirts on the merch store. I think you might enjoy them. One of them is the 4680 battery cell sort of schematic with the Dr. Know-It-All logo in the middle of it. So I thought that'd be pretty cool. So if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. The other one is a little tweet from Elon Musk recently that seems to have caught the internet by storm. It begins with T, ends with A, E, S, L in the middle. So I thought you all might enjoy that. I, <laughs> they're so hot off the press, I don't even have one myself yet, but I'll put Pictures up here, obviously, so you can look at them and feel free to check them out on the web store. All right, and on to the topic at hand today. I want to start off by being very clear, I am not an expert in this at all. I understand something about how computers work, how computer hardware works. I have the basic concepts here. I'm not going to get into the weeds because, quite frankly, I don't understand what the weeds are. But I think I have enough of a sense of this to give you a general overall picture and to try to explain why this is a real paradigm shift in computing and why it could make such a big, huge difference, particularly to things like full self-driving, robots, and other stuff like that. So anyway, without further ado, I am turning first to Wikipedia. There is a huge, I don't know, everybody's so negative about Wikipedia, but actually, as long as you're careful about making sure it's sourced properly, I think Wikipedia is amazing. It's a very concise place to find a lot of information. So anyway, I'm gonna start there. I'll look at some other sites too, of course, just to make sure we're consistent. But basically, this gives us a, a sense of what neuromorphic engineering or computing is. I'm gonna start with the TLDR or TLDW, <laughs> too long, didn't watch. Essentially what we have is transistors, when they began, had kind of a dual function. Originally, they were more like amplifiers. So if you've ever had like a vacuum tube amplifier, or quite frankly, the amplifier that's in here for the speaker, the amplifier that's in my big old Yamaha uh, receiver that you know produces sound when I'm listening to classical music while I'm working on other things besides filming videos and stuff. Anyway, that those use transistors. And the way that they use them is to amplify a signal. So you can run a very small oscillating signal through a set of transistors and that will produce a very large sound on the other end. And that is the, you know, one of the two primary ways that a transistor works. The other way that it works is as kind of a gate or a switch or something. So it's like a light switch. So, right, it's like off, on, off, on. And what happens is you pass a small current through something and that current turns something on or off. So basically to use it as an on-off switch, you've got like a current that you can pass through the transistor. And if the current is on, say, it will pass something through and if the current's off it won't pass something through. So that's how you use it as an on off switch but transistors also are amplifiers. They can be used to amplify things. So that is a crucial distinction and neuromorphic chips essentially are exploiting the second half of that which is why you'll often see them called analog as opposed to digital. Digital just means all we're dealing with is ones and zeros but of course the actual chips themselves, the transistors, are dealing with voltages. So if a voltage is above a certain threshold it counts as a one and if it's below that it counts as a zero. So it's the way that we're interpreting it. Everything at the bottom is analog, right? It's all just electrical signals. There's noise in the electrical signal thing. But by having a voltage gap that's really large between a zero and a one, you can basically ignore all of that noise and all the analoginess of it. And that makes digital computers work really, really well. They're super cool. They, you know, they film things. They're filming this. They're going to edit it. You're going to watch it on a computer someplace. Digital stuff works really, really well. But for modeling something like the human brain, they're not pretty particularly good at that. What you want is something that's more of a non-linear type of function. You don't want a binary on or off, you want something that's non-linear. So essentially you want to be able to give it some signal and have it amplify that signal more or less. So anyway, that's the basic concept that we're dealing with here. And as you can see from the Wikipedia article here, right, it says electronic analog circuits to mimic neurobiological architectures present in the nervous system. That's the basic concept of neuromorphic chips. 
they actually have been around for quite a while. Let me see Geeks for Geeks, right? I'll put all the links to all of this stuff in the description, of course. But Carver Mead in the 1980s was the one who actually came up with this. You know, if you think about it, uh, perceptrons have been around and they were actually analog to start with as well since the 1950s. In the 1980s, Jeff Hinton and, and Jan LeCun and those folks were working on a lot of the basic concepts that are only bearing fruit now. So here you can see Carver Mead back in the 1980s came up with the kind of concept of neuromorphic computing. And of course, over the years, there has been research that's been going on. IBM's been working on it, Intel's been working on it, Spinnaker's been working on it, and numerous other companies have been working on neuromorphic chips kind of under the table for a long time, right? So this is not something that's just like, aha, it's brand new. It's just that it's gone from lab to finally about to be commercially viable as a possibility for doing computing. One of the main reasons why is because we're turning more and more to using neural networks and artificial intelligence to do computing rather than traditional digital one zero computing. And if you wanna go even further back, a memristor is actually something I didn't even know about until I started researching this, but it was described originally in 1971 by Leon Chua and worked on, and you can see here from this like figure that essentially what he was doing was he was kind of coming up conceptually with an idea of you've got a capacitor which deals with voltage and charge and so if you've done any electrical engineering you probably know what this is otherwise don't worry about it but but basically one corner of this diagram or one quarter of this diagram is the capacitor that deals with voltage and charge this is a nonlinear relationship You've also got voltage and current, which you probably are more familiar with, and you put a resistor in the middle of that. So between voltage and current, you've got the resistor. Between current and magnetic flux, you've got the inductor. That's also very important. If you ever start up a gas car, it's got a solenoid in it, it uses an inductor, etc. So anyway, this is another nonlinear relationship. And he theorized that we then need something he called the memristor, which had a nonlinear relationship between charge and flux. And one of the possible ways of doing neuromorphic chips is to use what's called the memristor. Another thing that's really interesting about neuromorphic chips is there's a whole bunch of different possible ways of doing neuromorphic design. And you can actually see that here, right? You've got oxide-based memristors, spintronic memories, threshold switches, transistors that are more the traditional thing, but operate in more of an amplification sort of mode as far as I understand it. So anyway, there's a lot of different methodologies. Neuromorphic chips are not like one monolithic design. There's a whole bunch of different possibilities because again, this is all research. People don't know what's going to work the best. Interestingly enough here, we've also got the software aspect, which is training software-based neuromorphic systems of spiking neural networks can be achieved using error backpropagation, which is just like our traditional neural network running on digital simulation and so forth. You can use Python using SNN torch as opposed to PyTorch, <laughs> or using canonical learning rules based on biology like the BindsNet. I don't know what the BindsNet is personally, but it sounds really cool, so I'll have to look into that at some point. So anyway, you've got a hardware software kind of collaboration going on here. But one of the things that's important to look at here is this spiking neural networks. So essentially the way that this stuff works, our brains work, is that we have a thresholding system. So essentially we get inputs into one end of a synapse in a neuron. And if it achieves that threshold, we get a spike, which is a calcium spike, and it actually shoots an electrical signal down the neuron, which could be quite long. And then it comes out the synapses on the other end. So we're sort of modeling that. And if you think about that, none of that is digital. We don't have zeros and ones there. We have analog elements. We have gaining electrical charge. We have you know calcium and sodium that are working together to create these types of signals that happen. None of this stuff is digital. And the problem is, I think, was it James Dalma that said this? But anyway, somebody said that the traditional chips that we have, the traditional computer chips we have are spectacularly bad at doing neural network simulation. So one of the advantages that we have with doing this neural network simulation in this sort of context is that this analog type of computing works much better for the more analog type of neural network training that we want to do. Neural networks are really not digital. They're probably probabilistic at heart. And so simulating them using digital technology is actually a very inefficient thing to do, even using things like GPUs and so forth. So this is where neuromorphic chips really come in. And by the way, Tesla, of course, has never said that they're working on this publicly. 
But if they're not looking at this very, very closely, they're really not paying attention and they probably should be. One of the biggest advantages that neuromorphic chips have over traditional chips is power for compute, essentially. So if you look at this, the, this is a, the Geeks for Geeks, and it's obvious this person is not, English is not his first language or her first language. So anyway, bear with the fact that it's not written in the best proper English. But anyway, the human brain typically contains about 86, 87 billion neurons and a somewhere on the order of trillions of synapses. And yet we're able to use this for a mere 20 watts of power, right? So if you think about the old incandescent light bulbs that were 100 watts, it's like one fifth of one of those light bulbs can operate our brain most of the time, obviously. Power consumption goes up if you have to think hard about things. So maybe your brain's getting a little hot right now as you think about this. Anyway, but you know, 20 watts is nothing. And the human brain is able to achieve one exaflop of computation power approximately, you know, that's, a, <laughs> it's a guesstimate. We don't know exactly, but it's on the order of an exaflop Flop. Whereas this IBM Summit computer that uses 30 megawatts of power or six orders of magnitude more than the human brain only gets 200 petaflops. So it's an order of magnitude or two below human compute power while it's using six orders of magnitude more power. So one of the things I've talked about and I did this, you know, is the golden age of AI done? I was asking the question about whether we would run out of compute power. Basically, we would just, <laughs> things would become so hot, they would use so much power to get to the next phase of being able to compute these neural networks and everything that we wouldn't be able to keep going. And this is where neuromorphic chips really come in because they're designed specifically for this type of probabilistic analog type of computation. They weren't that popular before because they weren't really needed. We had digital computers and they did everything we wanted. But now that we're turning towards neural networks, which need that exact type of computation, and they're so much more memory efficient, we end up in a situation where these neuromorphic chips have really can come into their own. And just as one example, we've got Intel's Loihi. I think it's Loihi 2. I think that's how you pronounce it. Anyway, but they've got, I mean, this is an actual thing that you can go out and buy right now. So this is a new generation of neuromorphic computing, right? 10 times faster process processing, 60 times more interchip bandwidth, a million neurons, 15 times greater resource density, scalable open source software, right? So you can program with it and everything, fully programmable neuron models with graded spikes. Um, this, this spiking thing is really important, again, because it's analog, essentially you're getting just like the brain, the brain, the synapse, the, the neuron does not very much until it actually gets a thresholded thing and then it spikes like that. <laughs> and that's what you get. You get a literal spike that just goes out and you get a whole bunch of signal and then it goes away. So they're mimicking that with these types of chips. The most interesting part of this down below is some of the things that you can do with neuromorphic chips. So here you can see wheelchair bound pediatric patients, right, are able to use neuromorphic chips to help them out. Of course, over here, you've got robots that can feel like this. That's awesome. And notice that we've got power efficient neuromorphic processors. So one of the things is when you're dealing with robots and edge computing and cars and things like that, power is really important. You can't just create a 30 megawatt supercomputer to stick in your car because your battery would drain really, really fast. So anyway, so you've got to be able to have power efficient computation. And then you can also see, you know, computers can smell without noses. So that's a pretty cool thing too. And yes, there have been digital computing things that have done stuff like smelling. If you go to an airport, you may have a chance that you wouldn't see a dog, but actually dogs are still more efficient than computers at smelling, you know, bombs, whatever it is that they need to smell at, at airports. But anyway, instead of that, you can have these neuromorphic chips that can learn how to do things like smell and stuff too. So all of these things are really, really cool applications. Of course, full self-driving is a hugely important application of this. Full self-driving requires amazing amounts of compute power, and that requires a huge amount of power. And currently, as far as I understand it, Tesla's hardware three board, the thing that actually drives your car, runs at about 200 watts. So again, two of those old 100 watt incandescent light bulbs. It doesn't seem like a ton, but that's actually sucking down power that you can use to transport yourself. So what if we cut, could cut that down to like 10 or 20 watts or something, like a 10th of the amount of wattage, and we could increase our compute power at the same time, those things would be massive. They would allow the computer to run more complex neural network models, to run them more efficiently, and to be able to hopefully, you know, achieve that next level of full self-driving that is going to be difficult to do with current technology. 
So that's where we're going with neuromorphic chips. Neuromorphic chips really have a ton of potential, it seems like, in a very specific application. They are not going to replace your standard CPU in a computer or a phone or whatever it is. That's going to be around because we've got software. It's very robust. It's very mature. We understand what's going on. It's got software. It runs the whole system. This is something more like an ASIC. It's a specialized chip that will do specific things. So you would have a standard CPU and then you would offload your vision and your neural network tasks onto one of these neuromorphic chips to do the work. Or if you're training in a large scale environment, you would have a CPU that was the center of each of your rack servers or something like that. And then you might have really like a whole bunch of these neuromorphic chips that are training all the time. And then they pass the information back to the CPU and that writes out the new model, et cetera. Right? So it's going to be, it's not going to be one or the other. It's going to be a both sort of situation. You're going to have the neuromorphic chip that's cooperating with a traditional digital CPU, but they're each going to do the things that they're best at. So that's what's going to happen in the future. And I think that neuromorphic chips really honestly might be the solution to the power problem that I was projecting would be a real big problem for AI moving forward. So this is really exciting stuff. Again, edge computing, robots, cars, Anything that needs a low power envelope, your phone, a camera, who knows, right? It could, it could distribute into a whole bunch of things over time if it becomes mature. But of course, also, it will be super, super helpful for doing things like one-shot learning, which is basically that you can look at a picture or you can look at just a very small amount of data and you can learn things. One of the big problems with neural networks right now is you need outrageous amounts of data, like millions or billions of data points in order to train these very large neural networks like GPT-3 with 170 billion parameters took like five million dollars to train last year. That's a huge amount of compute power. It's a huge amount of data that they had that they had to scrape the whole web and give it like everything, right? So they had to give it all of this data in order to learn. One of the advantages of neuromorphic chips is that they can learn with a much, much smaller data set. And that is a huge thing too. Just again, like a human brain, right? In order to learn English or whatever language you learned, we didn't have to have the entire web plugged into our brains. We just had our parents talk to us and then our friends talk to us over time, right? So we picked it up with a relatively small amount of data. And that's another huge advantage of neuromorphic chips. So really power, the fact that they work much more like a human brain, they're more analog-y, they're more non-linear in their relationship, that's extremely helpful. And then also the fact that they, because of these things, they can learn much more rapidly on a small data set than neural networks can on digital computers. So all of this is really, really exciting stuff. I hope you think so too. All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and a little bit woo, mind expanding, right? <laughs> if you did, definitely like the video so other people can find it and consider subscribing for more of this. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much for your help and your support. I hope this helps to answer some questions. I've had several people ask me this on Patreon. <laughs> so one, one of the big reasons I pushed this to the front of the queue was because of you guys. So anyway, I hope this helps explain things a little bit. And of course, if you're interested in joining the team, check out the link in the description. Also, don't forget about our new designs for the 4680 battery cell and the Tesla meme shirt and the Tesla bot. And this and much more are available on t-shirts, mugs, bumper stickers, etc. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.